Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa I hope uh, everybody can hear me, can see me, inshallah. Okay, excellent. So, inshallah today, just going to wait one, one or two minutes just for some brothers to join inshallah. So inshallah today we're going to be discussing about the Qira'at Yeah, as we can see on the background on the screen there And we're going to discuss uh, a topic that's been a, a quite prominent topic in the last um, You know, couple of weeks where lots of people have been talking about the Qira'at uh, They've been talking about the nature of the Qur'an You know, and what does the Qur'an mean and what does the Qira'at have in terms of the implications to the preservation of the Qur'an and does it have any implications also regards to uh, you know the mu'jiza, the linguistic miracle of the Qur'an so there's been lots of topics, lots of discussions that have been taking place so I thought it would be, you know, it'd be interesting, it'd be good maybe inshallah to uh, maybe open up the discussion uh, to the brothers here and maybe to explain uh, some of the aspects of the Qur'an uh, of the Qur'an uh, in order to uh, get an appreciation in regards to this um, so I don't know if there's uh, any quick questions that brothers may have on this topic that you want to quickly write now and the reason why I want to know what questions you guys may have is because uh, it's good because then I understand uh, you know what your concerns are, what your thinking is, what level that you're expecting uh, the discussion to be at, etc. So, so um, yes, like I said, it'd be good. It'd be interesting to see what if a brother's got any particular quick questions that they want to ask right now before we dive in to the discussion. Um, so, Bismillah. Why are we talking about this topic? Well, I think it's quite obvious, isn't it? In the last few weeks, there's been a heightened debate or heightened discussion. And although I don't want to go into the, you know, the nitty gritties and start critiquing and discussing and debating about a particular person who made certain comments uh, about, um, yeah, you know, in, in an interview that he did, um, it has unfortunately caused people to question what is the nature of the Qur'an and also it has also caused many anti-Muslim propagandists people who want to attack Islam in order to yani, uh, use the statements of certain individuals Yasir Qadi, yeah I've said it and it says, you know, a particular statement about how there are many holes or there are holes within the traditional explanation of the Qur'at, yeah, of the Qur'an. Now obviously the first thing is obviously what Yas Qadi was saying was, you know, he didn't explain it, so he didn't go into much detail, so you know, we can't really go into a debate and discussion about what he meant and what he didn't mean, but unfortunately because of the words that he's used, it's being now used by other people uh, to sort of cast doubt in regards to the, uh, the Qur'at, and in the debates and discussions that I've had with brothers subsequent to that and also prior to that, because I've been reading books in regards to the issue of Qur'at uh, There's been online courses as well uh, That I was actually watching, you know, a few weeks prior to this interview uh, On the Qur'at uh, And I will, uh, in the comment section later on, I will show you, I'll link you to the course that's online uh, Which you can just access on YouTube now uh, Which is very good, alhamdulillah uh, and there's also some books as well that maybe uh, you know you can have a look at as well inshallah on this subject matter So I thought it'd be interesting and important to really get into this uh, discussion In order to really appreciate what the Qur'at are because a lot of people a lot of Muslims We may have a surface level knowledge or a certain basic understanding of what Qur'at are But when it comes to the, uh, the details or not even the details actually what the Qur'at are and how the Qur'at were yani, uh, decided, yeah, the choices, the, the, you know, how they were formulated or developed That a lot of people are quite unaware 
in regards to a lot of these topic areas. So I thought it would be important. And the reason why it's also important is because when uh, when um, any people who attack Islam on this topic area, we need to at least have some basic understanding of what the Qur'at are in order to be able to at least not be thrown into like chaos and doubt in regards to this uh, subject matter. Uh, wa alaikum as salam to the brothers who have uh, joined and given salams. Uh, so that's my short little introduction into the Qur'at. There's a few things that I need to, we need to discuss uh, today. I've got my whiteboard. I might use it, I might not. You know, it's one of them things. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so, hopefully, inshallah, everybody can uh, hear me. Uh, brothers are commenting upon my hair. That's, uh, you know, I've not had a haircut for about three months now. So, so wh where do we start with regards to this issue of Qur'at? Right, first discussion we need to have is what is the Qur'an? Uh, uh, what is the Qur'an? This is quite, you know, it sounds an obvious thing. What is the Qur'an? We all know what the Qur'an is. But we need to understand this because the definition of the Qur'an has a direct impact in understanding the Qur'at, subject matter, and generally the discussion about preservation. Yeah, so uh, what is uh, Qur'at? Normally, by the way, normally when I do these types of uh, topics, I know I've done a few Facebook Lives in the past, but recently I've been doing a lot of Zoom discussions. And normally I ask brothers questions in the zoom and they normally respond so it's a bit more interactive and two-way yeah so when we look at the issue and the topic of quran and what is the quran then obviously we say the quran is revelation from allah in word and meaning yeah that's really important that the revelation is in both word and meaning yeah so so we're going to say uh, uh so word and meaning yeah hopefully you can see that so that's what we, we understand is the, the Qur'an, that both the revelation, both in wording and meaning. Why is that important? Because we know Sunnah is understood to be revelation of meaning, but not wording. And that's why certain hadith of the Prophet ﷺ have been, what's the word, have been uh, narrated by meaning, as opposed to the direct wording. So some narration, some hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, are narrated by meaning but not necessarily word but the Quran has to be narrated or is revelation by both word and meaning so it means that the, the transmission of the Quran is both in these two aspects if it's not in these two aspects then we wouldn't call it Quran yeah second aspect regards to this we say obviously the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah so it's from Allah yeah and it's revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yeah, by Angel Jibreel alayhi salam. Yeah, and so it's, it's word of Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam through the Angel Jibreel alayhi salam. That comes that is agreed upon by Ijma Sahaba. Yeah, or Ijma as Sahaba. Yeah, so hopefully that's uh, any uh, understood when we talk about Quran. Yeah, not Qur'at. We're not talking about Qur'at yet. But when we talk about Quran, we're saying both the revelation is both in wording and meaning. It is a speech of Allah to the revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam through Angel Jibreel alayhi salam that is uh, transmitted to us through the consensus. Ijma means consensus. Of the companions, so this is what we understand as the Quran. So anything that's not ijma sahaba, yeah, would not be considered Quran. So ijma sahaba is the manner by which the Quran is transmitted to us through, you know, through obviously through the prophets. They learnt it from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who is revealed from Allah subhanahu wa taala by Angel Jibril alayhi salam. But this issue of ijma sahaba is critical, yeah. What do we mean by ijma? Ijma means uh, consensus, yeah, the collective agreement of the companions. Why do we say ijma sahaba? Yeah, because of two reasons really. The first reason in regards to ijma is because ijma, or the first reason why ijma is uh, critical, yeah, in this point is because of one, rational reasons, and two, 
textual reasons. Yeah, so I'll explain. So Ijma, a consensus of the companions, we know that when the companions agreed upon a revelation, which means that they all agreed upon what the Prophet ﷺ brought, then it is impossible for them to have agreed upon something which would be in a collective error. Yeah? It would be impossible that all of them had learnt and listened to what the Prophet ﷺ said and made an error within it. Now an individual companion potentially can make an error, but a collective, yeah, it becomes impossible. This is what we're saying, yeah? It becomes impossible. Why do we say that? Well, we know that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the companions to memorize the Qur'an, that there were a number of companions who wrote down the Qur'an, that there were a number of scribes who also were designated to write down the Qur'an as well. So there was a push to learn and study the Qur'an from the Prophet ﷺ, memorize it, and then transmit it. So what they agreed upon, rationally speaking, could not have been agreeing upon something which is a collective error. So that's the first thing, rationally. Secondly, is from a textual point of view. What do we mean by textual point of view? We mean from what the Qur'an and the Sunnah state. Yeah? So the Qur'an, in many verses of Qur'an, many verses within the Qur'an, praises the Sahaba collectively. Yeah? So like for example in Surah Ali Imran, verse 110, you are the best nation brought forward to mankind. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Yeah? You are the best nation brought forward to mankind. This is a statement that is directed to the companions, but also we know that can be general to the ummah so long as they fulfill the conditions. But for the companions, it was a statement about them initially. Also in surah, uh, other surahs within uh, verses in the Quran, in surah, surah Bayyana, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he's pleased with them and they are pleased with their Lord. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about being pleased with them in a collective sense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased collectively with the companions, has said that they are the best nation in regards to the companions. Secondly, we also have within the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam that many a hadith have come that praises the companions, yeah? as the best generation uh, and as a collective and also with individual companions as well but certainly as a collective being the best generation so we've got one rational evidence and two we've got two sources of revelation the quran and the sunnah both testifying to the the yani that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with the companions as a group now being pleased with the companions as a group implies that the companions as a group do not make an error, yeah. Do not because you can't, you're not going to be pleased with people who make an error. So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He's pleased with them and they're pleased with their Lord, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is applying, you know, establishing to us that they do not make an error collectively, yeah. Now, there is a third textual proof. The third textual proof is in Surah Hijra. Uh, verse 9, which is the famous verse of Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the dhikr is uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the dhikr and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the ones who will preserve the dhikr, preserve the Quran. Yeah, so the dhikr here is understood to be Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they revealed it and also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the one that preserves it. So now the method of preservation will also be uh, considered definite. So the Qur'an is definitely preserved and the method that achieves that preservation will also be definite. What's that method? Ijma Sahaba, the consensus of the companions. So we've got three evidences. Rational evidence, yeah, or four evidences you want to say. One is a rational evidence that collective group of people will not make an error when we're talking about thousands. Secondly is the Qur'an praises them as a group. Thirdly is the Sunnah praises them uh, as a group in the best generation. And fourthly, the fact that the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an that the Qur'an will be preserved. Therefore, the method of preservation is also attested to. Yeah? So it's by implication in that context. Yeah? Hopefully that makes sense. If there's any uh, questions, you know, uh, please uh, any, uh, ask away yeah? on Facebook. And I'll try and respond to it as soon as possible, inshallah. Yeah? But hopefully that's clear. So... We've now understood now what what is Quran, and the reason why we said what is Quran is because we wanted to get to this point actually, Ijma Sahaba. Yeah, that's really important with regards to this. So, um, 
And the next discussion, or the next point is going specifically into the preservation discussion. Uh, when I say specifically, I'm going to take a slight detour again. But when we talk about the, the preservation, we need to separate two things. Yeah, Preservation, one thing, and the proof and the evidences for the Qur'an. Yeah, so although, you know, we know and we say that any the uh, one of the indicating evidences for the divine origin of Islam the Quran, and the Qur'an is the fact that it's preserved because no other text, no other claim to a religious text has been preserved, yeah, as we know, or there was no mechanism or methodology to preserve. We know there was a mechanism and methodology to preserve the Qur'an, but it's also important to note that it even if I don't know how the Qur'an was preserved, yeah, even if I don't know how the Qur'an is preserved, but I can recognize that the Qur'an is a mu'jiza, is a miraculous event or mirac miracle, is beyond human productive capability. If I can work, if I can establish that rationally, then I can establish that it has been preserved. How do we do this? Obviously, we know you know, the Qur'an is a mu'jiza because uh, it, it's a linguistic miracle. The fact that the Qur'an contains prophecies that came true during the life of the Prophet uh, That the Sunnah has prophecies within it that also confirm, uh, you know, the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And obviously the linguistic miracle uh, demonstrates quite easily and clearly as well that no human being was able to produce something like the Qur'an. Yeah, so I don't want to go into too much detail because of that. But once we've established that rationally, then when the Qur'an says that this Qur'an will be preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we take that as textual evidence, meaning evidence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So I, I, like for example, if I didn't know anything about how the Qur'an was preserved, I didn't know about this idea of ijma, of the consensus of the companions, or if I didn't understand the, you know, the rasm of the Uthmanic Mus'haf, or any of these things. But I can rationally deduce that the Qur'an could only have been produced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rationally, that it was beyond human cap productive capability. And I can, you know, affirm this. And then I know that this verse says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved the Qur'an. Then I don't really need to go into much of the details about the preservation. Yeah. Uh, in order to have sakina, tranquility in my heart, that the Qur'an is absolutely preserved. Yeah. Why? Because we've established the divine origin of the Qur'an. That the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we've established that, then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-alim, yeah, the all-knowing, tells us that this Qur'an will always be preserved, alhamdulillah. Yeah? We can establish that that is textual revelatory evidence from the creator who knows all things yeah so that's a, and that's a really important point because sometimes people get lost in the technicalities of these discussions but don't appreciate that point yeah so if we appreciate that point that once we've established the quran is from a divine origin and there's many evidences direct indirect evidences that we can prove the prophethood of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the quran is the word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even for a non-arab speaker then we can establish that what is mentioned in the Qur'an is qat'i, yeah, is definite, certain, yeah, like the preservation of the Qur'an. So, we've mentioned uh, what is Qur'an, we've mentioned how we can approach this discussion. The next thing that I really want to talk about is, okay, this discussion about variance. What is variance, yeah? So I'm just going to take this off. It rubs off. What is what do we mean by variance? Why you know? Oh, is this a right word to use? Yeah. So even before we talk about qiraat at this moment in time, we're going to talk about variance and why some people find this problematic uh, term. Yeah. And when I say some people, I'm talking about non-Muslims who like to attack the Quran. Yeah. So variance. Well, the first thing that we need to understand is that variance or variant meanings or variant readings, it has a particular uh, intellectual or any uh, particular reality when it comes to discussing about biblical sources, yeah, like the Old Testament or the New Testament. So when they talk about variant readings within their scripture, 
uh, like the New Testament, they are talking about how there are different versions of the same event, yeah? And that that different versions of the same event is because there may have been different authors or different scribes who have transmitted from that author, and that causes variance. The variant in New Testament, therefore, is human uh, error, yeah? Or human uh, input within the New Testament. So when we talk about variant within the Qur'an, Sometimes what they do is they say, okay, we have variant readings, which is indication or indicative of unintentioned changes within the original text. You talk about variants, and therefore that also indicates the same thing that we understand about our New Testament, i.e. the Christians is what they would say. Yeah. So this is what they will talk about. This is uh, what they mean by variants. And this is why some brothers, they mention that perhaps maybe we shouldn't talk about, use the word variant because it has this connotation of change from the original text within the you know discussion around New Testament and other scripture. But rather maybe we should use the word reading. Yeah. So, you know, maybe we should use the word reading instead. But, you know, the reality is, is that we're using Arabic words. And when we're looking at Arabic words, we are looking at words which are estimated meanings within another language. So Qir'at, Ahruf, these are terms which they don't really have a connotation yeah, within, uh, you know, uh, within English language uh, or even within English literature. It's a very, it's a very you know, Arab-centric approach towards understanding of literature and language talking about Qirat and Ahruf, it's a very, you know, so therefore it's very difficult for somebody to appreciate it who may not necessarily have some of the background knowledge and understanding in regards to these things. So that's why they think, oh, Qirat, differences, differences in words must mean variant, variant here must mean scribal error or human input to change the original source. Yeah, so we say, no, 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 that's not exactly what we understand. So the main thing is, is that when we talk about New Testament as an example, variant here is, I'm going to use this word, unintended. Unintended. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't spell that. So New Testament is unintended. So the question then becomes, is variance or readings, is this unintended? Yeah? So is variance or the Qira'at or even the discussion of Ahruf, but we can talk about Qira'at specifically, is that unintended within the revelation? Yeah? Was it departure from what the Quran actually was originally uh, recited as? Yeah? So this is what we're going to look at. So, uh, so obviously the answer is no, of course not. The variance is not unintended. And we have two main evidences for the reason why oh we actually have many evidences for what uh, why we don't have so why we have variants which was intended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as opposed to variants which was unintended and was the uh, product product of human interpolation yeah or interpretation interpolation is probably a better word with regards to that Sorry, I'm kneeling down and getting a bit cramped. So, uh, anyway, bismillah. So, very, so is it? So, what are the two main evidences? Yeah, in regards to this. So, the first evidence that we can look at, and these are two separate evidences. Yeah, so we're going to treat these as two separate evidences, not too complicated. These are two main evidence. There are other evidences as well, indications as well, which we'll also maybe talk about. Uh, later on, uh, or brothers might maybe even make comments about it. The first evidence that shows that it's unintended is, and if brothers may be paying attention, would be Ijma as Sahaba. What do we mean by this? It means that there was a consensus of the companions that the Quran was read with different variations. Yeah? And that the Qur'an was both wording and meaning and therefore the variations that were read differently by different companions and they agreed to it. They agreed that that actually does this. 
that that means it is a consensus of the companions. Now, if I have no other evidence except the Ijma Sahaba, then that's acceptable because we said Quran is what? It's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet وسلم, by Angel Jibreel alayhi salam, which was agreed upon by Ijma as Sahaba, by the consensus of the companions. So if the consensus of the companions agree upon variants, it means that that was the agreement upon what the Quran was. Yeah, what the Quran was. But we don't just have Ijma Sahaba. We have Sunnah. Yeah. So we actually have explicit, numerous ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that talks about how the Quran was revealed in seven ahruf. Yeah. Now those people that may be following the discussions over the last few weeks or three years if you've studied it previously and read about it, there is obviously there's a debate ikhtilaf over what this term ahruf means. Yeah. Now to be honest Ahruf ikhtilaf, the, the, the difference of opinion over what this term ahruf means, doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't. From our, from the perspective of trying to understand, is there an internally consistent argument that Muslims pr bring in order to demonstrate that the Quran is preserved, yeah, and that the variant readings are from revelation, then having a specific definition of ahruf does not imp uh, does not yani what's the word it does not uh, have an effect upon the theological belief of the muslims yeah so yes obviously there are different ver you know views about what ahruf are maybe we'll talk a little bit about them but we don't want to go into that the main thing is is that there are numerous hadith in fact the hadith are mutawatir ma'nawi mutawatir ma'nawi means mutawatir by meaning where the wording differs but the concept is the same. So what's the concept? Is that the Prophet ﷺ said that the, the Qur'an was revealed in seven ahruf. Yeah, there were seven ahruf that the Qur'an was revealed in. There's numerous hadith about this. That, you know, one narration in which the Prophet ﷺ said to Angel Jibreel salam, you know, reveal to me another ahruf and then another ahruf and then it was to seven ahruf to make it easy for the ummah. You know, I'm paraphrasing this particular narration, but you know, there's numerous narrations like this. Uh, so we know that therefore there was there was ahruf, yeah, different ahruf. What's the implication? What does that? What can we understand at the very basic level? What ahruf means? Yeah. Well, we know ahruf means there was variance in the way it was recited. How do we know this? Because the other narrations in which the Sahaba differed with one another over the way it was recited yeah so the famous narration again there's numerous narrations like this one from Ubay ibn Ka'ab and another one about Umar and his difference by Hisham uh, there are numerous narrations like for example Umar where he heard Hisham ibn uh, uh, Hakim uh, uh, recite Surah Furqan in a way that he, the Umar radiallahu anh, had not been taught by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and as the narration goes on, the, the Umar radiallahu anh got, you know, uh, concerned, and so let uh, Hisham finish his salah, then grabbed him, dragged him to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he'd recited in a way that had not been taught to him by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet Sallam said to Umar radiallahu an, recite uh, from the surah, and he recited, and the Prophet Sallam he said, it was revealed like that, and then when Hisham uh, recited, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it was revealed like that. Yeah, again, it's a, it's a relatively long narration, but he talks about this. And what's interesting is that when Umar radiallahu an, he went to Hisham initially and said, who taught you that recitation? Hisham said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught him. Yeah, so what do and then the Prophet then went on in that narration said the the Quran has been revealed in seven ahruf. So what do we understand by this and other narrations in which the Sahaba differed with the ahruf and went back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that the recitation 
had variance. Yeah, that's the first thing. One, recitation had variance. Secondly, that the variance was uh, accepted and was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And thirdly, the Prophet Sallallahu taught these variances as well. Yeah, so we understand these things. Yeah, there are some nuances. And again, if brothers want to ask those questions later on about some nuances on that particular point about Ahruf, we can talk about that. But that's really what we need to understand from our perspective. From an ordinary Muslim's perspective, we need to just understand that, that the Ijma Sahaba accepts that there's different variances in recitation of certain words. And secondly, that the Sunnah affirms that there are different variances, Ahruf, yeah, if you want to use the word Ahruf, and that the Ahruf even though there are multiple definitions or multiple opinions about precisely what Ahruf means, ultimately they all generally agree upon the fact that there was different variations in how uh, a verse was revealed, uh, a verse was recited by one companion, uh, by uh, by the Prophet to one companion, a group of companions to another group of companions. Yeah, so that's Ahruf. So we know that. So. Um, what are the main opinions regards to Ahruf? There are basically two main opinions regards to the definition of Ahruf. There are 40 of odd opinions, 41 or so opinions about Ahruf. But the two main ones are that Ahruf are dialects and that there were seven dialects. And that therefore the Quran was re revealed in seven different dialects. Some of those dialects would have um, different synonyms, yeah, so different words for the same meaning. Uh, different slight ways of pronunciation, etc. We'll talk about that later on uh, uh, as well. The second main opinion, which is, I think, the opinion that Ibn al-Jazari, he mentions and discusses this point, which I think is a stronger opinion as well, is, is that the, the ahruf are categories of variance. Yeah, the ahruf are categories of variance. So, irrespective of whether you take one or the other, ultimately, what you'll find is that the ahru, the, the, the variants yeah, within the Qur'an's recitation will come with different, um, cate under different categories. Yeah? So uh, uh, we can talk about that as well. Is there any, uh, any questions before we uh, any quickly uh, move on? Yeah? Uh, get a bit... Got to make sure... Uh, yeah, we've got a bit of time still before Maghrib. Uh, right, okay. So, so we understand that. So we understand what Qur'an is. We understand the fact that uh, we don't even need to understand the preservation if we understand that and, and establish that the Qur'an is mu'jizah. We also understand now that the variance is not unintended. Yeah, it's intended within the revelation or it's intended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended there to be variant readings of certain uh, verses uh, of the Qur'an. Yeah? Or in certain words within the certain verses of Qur'an. And we've established that because of Ijma Sahaba and we've established that by Sunnah. And we said that the hadith that talk about Ahruf are actually mutawatir ma'anwi. Which means that, that they are mass transmitted. May have different wordings, may be talking about different incidences, but they all talk about seven Ahruf. Yeah? And seven ahruf were seen as different ways of reciting the same surah or the same verses, yeah, but different ways. Okay, so let's now look at really quickly. Me is better on Zoom actually than doing it on Facebook Live, but anyway, because that way I can ask you guys questions and see if you understand, get a bit more interaction going. Maybe next time, inshallah, I might do this on. Uh, I was actually going to do a PowerPoint presentation as well, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, to one takes too long, and secondly, I was working all day today, so didn't have any time to do that. And also, I didn't know how to Facebook share, screen share on Facebook Live. Yeah, so uh, you know, I use uh, normally iPad or iPhone to do all this. Uh, so anyway, so okay, so we know we we generally understand that the. Um, that there are variations, right? So what are those variations? The variations that you find within the Quran can be subdivided into seven general categories, yeah? 
seven general categories. So these are the seven, seven general categories. And I'm going to explain, you know, some, um, you know, very briefly at this point, because we don't need to go into the much detail in terms of the actual categories. Yeah, you, you know, you can have a look at different books and uh, different discussions with regards to that. But I'm just going to go through very briefly some of the seven categories. The first category that we can talk about is... Uh, Dialectical differences. Yeah. And this is the majority. Yeah. So the accents. So, you know, in down south, uh, they use the word down south of England. I'm talking about. They use the word uh, grass. Yeah. There's a uh, you know my grass is very green. Yeah. Whereas up north we say grass. Yeah. We have a nice uh, garden with a nice grass, yeah, so flat egg, or glass, yeah, pass me that glass of water, yeah, or they'll say pass me a glass of water. So it's accent, dialectical difference or accent difference. We know, for example, in certain uh, dialects, they would say wadduha, which is the normal hasim uh, way of reciting, but other dialects, they say wadduhe, yeah, they say masha Allah, mashe Allah, yeah, so... There will be slight differences, sirat, zirat, yeah, so even the sound of the letters sounds slightly different. So the first one will be a dialectical differences, regards to that, and that's where the majority exists. Then what we have is uh, differences that affect the wording and also potential meaning. So this is, you know, just as a point, you know, when we all learn or learn if some of us come across Qiraat like when I was a kid I came across Qiraat when I was quite young and because I came across Qiraat when I was quite young by Muslims who explained it was like yeah no big deal yeah alhamdulillah obviously if you, you know this is the point about Qiraat if you come across it from if you never heard about Qiraat before and then you come across it from this anti-Muslim you know wants to really show Islam in the worst possible light and then he talks about these variations then it's like you know, for a person who's never heard about it, then it can be quite shocking. But normally when we talk about um, any uh, uh we talk about it from like, oh, it's just a dialectical difference. It's the way they pronounce words. Like in English, we say, you can say Caribbean. Yeah, I'm from the Caribbean or Caribbean. Yeah, both are, uh, you know, phonetically correct to say tomato or tomato. Yeah, potato or potato. I don't think that's uh, correct, but, anyway. but tomato, tomato, yeah. So you can you can have these types of differences. So sometimes when we are taught about qiraat, we're taught about that qiraat are just like this, and then you got this clever anti-Muslim propagandist who turns around and says, "Yeah, but those dialectical differences in some have effect upon meaning, yeah. So there are." meaning changes within the Quran yeah and so therefore people are like hold on there's a meaning change so we need to understand that so there are other category differences yeah so the second one is difference to in Iraq yeah so these are the grammatical indicators the diacritical marks you know fatah, kasra, dhamma etc so the Arab may be different, yeah, and that can have effect upon the meaning. Famous example of this would be the example in I think it is uh, Surah Maida, uh, the Ayat of Quran, which talks about uh, wudu, yeah, performing wudu, and it talks about how it says, "Wash your arms, wipe your head, and your feet," yeah, and in the halves, the Arab of feet links to the washing in the warsh. Uh, Qur'at, it actually links to um, the wiping yeah, of the head. So the i'rab can have an effect upon that. Yeah. So number three would be uh, differences in consonants. Can you believe that? Differences in consonants. Yeah. So what do we mean by that? So obviously we know in the Arabic language there are no letters for vowels. That's why we have these diacritical marks. Yeah? So in the Arabic language you just have consonants. 
and in some of the Qur'at, some of the letters are different, yeah? And that's because in the, not because, uh, but it, we'll go into the because later on, but some of the contents of the noon or the ya or the ba or the ta, they may be different in some of the Qur'at, yeah? And those differences can affect meaning or cannot affect meaning. Yeah, so there may be consonant differences in certain letters. So, for example, some verses of Quran may say, uh, "We forgive," and the same verse in a different Quran says, "He, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, I He forgives." Yeah, so that's a consonant difference with regards to this. Uh, number three, four. What's the number four is that nouns may come singular. In some Qur'at or dual or they may come feminine or they may come masculine as well yeah so you know you you know so that's a, another example of Qur'at difference five or variants variants difference variants that we find in the, the Qur'at Number five, differences uh, in which there is substitution of one word for another, yeah, so synonyms, six, is um, differences in uh, word order, so word ordering, and seven is uh, Addition or deletion of words, and these are normally what we term particle words like min, yeah, or pronouns like huwa, yeah. So some qiraat will have a verse in which the min exists, and in the same verse in another qiraat, in another variation reading, it doesn't have. Amen. Or in one Qur'at it will have huwa and in another Qur'at it will not have huwa. Yeah? The pronoun. So, those are the seven category differences. And some scholars say that these seven, if you can see it, these seven here, category differences, are the seven ahruf that's mentioned. Yeah? And some scholars add some extras. Yeah? Uh, but these are the general seven category differences that you'll find within the Qur'an generally yeah, um, uh, when we look at the variations and the variances now, is there a problem with any of this? is there an issue, the fact that we can have noun, singular, dual, feminine, masculine or we could have synonyms or we could have consonant difference or Arab difference addition or deletion of particular words, uh, small words Within, the, within a verse of Qur'an. Is there a problem in regards to this? Well, we have to go back to our foundation. What's our foundation? Is that one, that the Qur'an is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wording and meaning. Two, that obviously there is mu'jiz of Qur'an. Yeah, so uh, the Qur'an is a miracle. Three, obviously the Qur'an through Ijma Sahaba was preserved and also the Ijma Sahaba agreed upon this being Qur'an, yeah? So they agreed that you can have these types of variations and it would still be considered Qur'an and uh, the other point as well is that the Sunnah explains through numerous hadith that there was variation, yeah? It doesn't explain what the types of, you know, what the variations were, that the ahruf were, the modes were, but that it uh, that was understood that there was variation that's the point yeah so therefore these things are now intended you know uh, variations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended with regards to that now we know isn't it through numerous hadith that the reason why it was intended there's some evidence that where the Prophet talked about how it was made easy for the Arabs yeah because different Arabs have different ways different synonyms they may have used Arab slightly different they may you know, uh, have other types of uh, differences that help them appreciate and memorize the Quran 
and also help them appreciate the mu'ajas of the Qur'an. You know, if it's in the dialect that they could understand and they had mastery over, and that the, the or the harf that they had mastery over, and the Qur'an came in that particular harf, then that can help with both of that. So, there's evidences, clear-cut, categorical evidences, on the level of Tawatr and Ijma, that variations exist within the Qur'an, and that these variations were uh, intended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. So next thing, what is Qur'at? Because now actually, now we can start to understand what Qur'at are. What does it mean when we say Hafs? That we are reciting from the Hafs an Asim. Or what does it mean when we are reciting Warsh? Because these are people. So why do we, why do we name these Qur'at by people when we say these Qur'at? The variations comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, as a revelation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah. So what's going on there? Well, this is the this is the point. Yeah, this is the interesting thing. Qur'at were the selections, yeah, were the choices that the uh, Quran scholars made when it came to how to read a particular verse. Yeah. By the way, just before I just mention that point, yeah, this here. Which affects, you know, wording meaning, potentially meaning, yeah, or Arab. These only affect about 750 or so words of the Quran, yeah. Out of the entire Quran, which has over 77,000 words, only 700 will be like these things. Dialectical differences, there may be a, a bit more. But these things, but dialectical differences like Caribbean, Caribbean, not really tomato, tomato, it's not really that important. It's not significant, I should say. But these things, even if people say they're significant, they only affect 0.9% of the Quran. 99.1% or so of the Quran are identical from the Qur'at. Yeah, are identical from the Qur'at. Yeah. Now. Like I said about Qur'at, we said Qur'at are the selection yeah, of the scholars of Qur'an or the, the reciters of Qur'an. And they obviously were scholars. Yeah, They're not, You know, today when we talk about Qari, we, we, Qari is like considered the, the low level, you know, scholar. Yeah, he's a Qari. Yeah, so he, yeah, he recites Qur'an. Yeah, but the Qur'an, the, the Qari... In the time of the Sahaba, Tabi'een, you know, the time of the Salaf, they were scholars, yeah, and they did a lot of deep research, yeah, and studying into this, yeah. So what did the, the Qaris do? The Qaris selected a particular combination. Why, why did they select a combination? Well, think about this. When I recite Surah Al-Fatiha, or when we recite Surah Al-Fatiha in our Salah, are we going to recite every variation of every verse within Surah Al-Fatiha? Now there's generally three variations within Surah Al-Fatiha. There's a variation of uh, Malik, Malik and Malik, yeah? So Malik, Maliki o Middin, or Maliki o Middin. So I'm, when I'm reciting Quran, am I going to repeat that twice? Or Alay him? Alayhum, am I going to repeat that twice? Am I going to say Sirat or Zirat? Yeah, and repeat that. So I'm not going to repeat the Quran. In fact, the Sahaba didn't repeat the uh, when they recited the verse, they didn't recite every variation of that verse that was revealed in, rather, they just recited it in one variation. Yeah, so the Qadi he selects, he says, All right, I'm going to recite Malik with Alayhim. Yeah, and Sirat. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to select Malik as opposed to Malik, and I'm going to select Alayhim as opposed to Alayhum, and I'm going to uh, select Sirat as opposed to Zirat. Yeah, and they had reasons and explanations for this. I don't want to go into the specific reason, but they made the choice. Yeah, they made the choice of what. Of the accepted re, uh, p uh, potential choices that exist 
they made the choice of which choices to adopt. So if you think about this now and just think about Surah Fatiha, you know, you could have a recitation, a Qur'at now, where you recite Malik with Alayhum, potentially, I'm saying potentially. There are rules that govern when you can um, choose between the two different types. That's why the Qadis were able to understand which choices were able to go together correctly. But there is potential that you could take Malik King with Alayhim, yeah, or Alayhum. So depending upon the permutations now, you're going to get different Qiraat, yeah. All the recitations are correct. The permutations are the Qiraat. Yeah, so I can, you know, it's like going, uh, um, it's like uh, you go to a, a burger place and the burger place has a menu and it says you can select what type of burger, what type of bun, yeah, what type of, you know, salad, maybe like Subway is a good example of this. You go to Subway, they say what, you know, what bread do you want, yeah, and then they say do you want, do you want it toasted or non-toasted, yeah, do you want, what type of filling do you want in it. Do you want barbecue sauce or garlic mayonnaise or whatever? Yeah, so you can create your own permutations, but you can only create your own permutations from the accepted variations. Yeah, and your permutation becomes what we term the qiraat. So hafs and asim, meaning hafs from asim, means that it was his permutations from Surah Al Fatiha. All the way to Surah Al Nas. Yeah, so the whole of the Quran, he selected the permutations that he saw best for the for his recitation. Yeah, and they had certain reasons for that. And we can, whoever's got questions, we can ask, uh, seek questions for that. Yeah. Other scholars had their own permutations. So Imam al Shafi'i, rahimullah, had his own qira'at. Yeah, so he had his own qira'at. Even though he himself, I think he studied. His recitation from Ibn Kathir al-Makki, not Ibn Kathir the Mufassir, Ibn Kathir the reciter al-Makki. So he, he learned from him as well as other uh, Qaris. But he had his own Qira'at, his own selective choices yeah, from the accepted readings. yeah. So hopefully that's clear. What do we mean by Qira'at? We mean the selections. Yeah, from the accepted readings, and we also mean, uh, you know, the selection from the accepted readings uh, that are potentially there, and the combinations that were created as a result. So when we talk about Warsh, it was Warsh's combination, yeah, or it was um, any Ibn Kathir al Makki's combination, yeah. So that's what we do. So now the question then becomes, okay. How did they choose what, combin what, what was the selected variant for their combination, for their permutation? How did they choose between that? Yeah. So that might be a, a good question that people ask. And there is three general, some say four general um, criteria for this. Yeah. So let me just rub this off so we can explain. So I don't think this is complicated. This is not complicated, is it? Did they select their choices for what uh, to use the reading, or did they just read it the way that it is how uh, they were taught? Right. So, so Nafi, one of the parties, uh, he studied with seventy parties. Yeah, so he learned his Quran, he memorized Quran with 70 Tabi'een. And also, I think amongst them were Sahaba as well. Yeah, so 70. And so, what he did was he said, Right, some of, um, so he said, Some of these selections that I've made, yeah, are in agreement with how other people have selected it. 
so I'm going to take it in that way. The permutation I'm talking about, yeah, the permutation, yeah. Um, so, uh, like I said, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven category differences of variations, as we said, di dialectical differences, Arab, consonant differences, nouns, uh, synonyms, etc. Yeah, and so they may take like that and have their particular combination with a particular verse which has a variance within it yeah and that becomes this so how did they select how did they select this variance how did they ensure that the variant that they so, so for example Mim Lam Kaf Malik yeah or Malik Malik or Malik could be pronounced Mim Lam Kaf could be pronounced Malaka as well. Yeah? So when we say Maliki o Medin, we can also say Maliki o Medin and we can also say Malaka yo Medin. Yeah? So there's, I think there's even a fourth way to pronounce uh, Mim Lam Kaf in that verse. So how did they choose which one was correct and which one was of the acceptable choices? Yeah, which one was the acceptable choices? So they had three ca uh, categories, uh, or three categories, uh, but it was, uh, you know, there was one that was differed, and that one that was differed, they added a fourth uh, criteria, and we'll talk about that. And in fact, even the differences are not really differences, they're the same thing. So, one, multiple chains. Of that variance, yeah. So whether that's Malik or Malik, there needed to be multiple chains that went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one, yeah. So when we look at the word Malaka, we don't have multiple chain. We only have an Ahad chain. So that one was rejected. So you can't say Malik or your Medin. You can only say Malik and Malik. Yeah. Two is that it had to be in accordance with the Uthmanic Musahif. Not Mushaf, Musahif. It's the plural. Yeah. So I'm just a bit concerned about time for Maghrib. Yeah. So it had to be in accordance with Uthmanic Mus'hafs, yeah, or Musahif. And uh, what does that mean? So here we've got multiple chains. So Malik and Malik, you needed to have numerous narrators who narrated from a person who narrated from a person who narrated or learned from a person who narrated in a particular way, who learned from a person who recited in a particular way, all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, multiple chains that said Maliki o Middin, and multiple chains that said Maliki o Middin. If it didn't have multiple chains, it would be rejected and it would not be considered Quran. Two, it had to be in accordance with the Uthmanic Mus'haf. Quick uh, point after the Prophet وسلم, passed away, Umar, uh, Abu Bakr an, gathered the Quran with Tha um, Zaid ibn Thabit an, and brought them together into one Mus'haf. Yeah? Or Musahif, yeah, but you know, it was bound book, yeah, let's say bound book. And then during the time of Uthman, an, because we had variants accepted, intended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the revelation of the Quran, some of the Tabi'een, because now obviously we're talking about yani, uh, Uthman's period is 25 years after Hijri, so now you've got hundreds of thousands of uh, people entering into Islam. Or at least, you know, quite a lot, thousands. You've got uh, Persia, you've got uh, Byzantine, you've got the whole of Egypt, you've got North Africa, parts of North Africa. <clears throat> you know, you've got lots of people entering into Islam now. They are learning Quran and they are learning variations, variances which are accepted and some variations which are not. But what's happening now is that they're differing with one another. They're saying, oh, yours is not Quran, this is Quran. 
yeah and therefore Uthman radiallahu an within 25 years or 26 years or so after Hijri he goes back to uh, Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu an and says to Zayd, Zayd ibn Thabit let us produce official copies of the mushaf of the the uh, you know agreed upon mushaf and that this mushaf now would be sent to the different regions of the Khidafa and the Qali and Hafiz would also be sent with the person with the mushaf as well to recite from the mushaf and all other mushafs will be destroyed yeah so now what Uthman radiallahu and did which is Ijma as sahaba yeah so it means it's consensus of the companions what he did is he restricted the variations of reading to what was produced by uh, or what he produced in agreement with the other companions Zayd ibn Thabit and his committee upon the written copy of the Quran yeah now you have to think about it here now some of the variants had Words, huwa, min, and some variances don't have that. So Uthman radiallahu an, he didn't just produce one mushaf with different copies of that one mushaf. He had numerous mushafs, musahif, yeah, which were standardized. Some of them <coughs> would include the variance with the min or the huwa, yeah, or the synonym that's used, yeah. So some of them would actually incorporate those categories of differences and some of them would be different, would not include those categories of differences. So they were sent out. Yeah, so that makes sense. The other aspect about Uthmanic Mus'haf was that the early Arabic script was not, uh, did not have dots. We know it didn't have diacritical marks, everybody knows that, but it didn't have dots. So the Ba and the Ta, the Qaf and the Fa, yeah, would not be distinguished in uh, the early Arabic script, yeah. So it came as a later development during Hajjaj bin Yusuf uh, time, yeah. So therefore, the multiple readings, yeah, the, or the variant readings, could be read within the Musahif that Uthman radiallahu an authorized, yeah. So Malik and Malik can be read with the Uthmanic, uh, you know, um, book, Mus'haf, yeah? So Malik and Malik can be read within that. Uh, those which had consonant changes, yeah? So a letter change would could be read within the Uthmanic uh, Mus'haf. Those which had Min or Hua, or the difference of I'rab could be read, yeah, within the Uthmanic uh, Mus'haf, yeah? Now some... This is where some of the controversy comes in, which is that some of the Orientalists claim that they did not need this first criteria, multiple chains going back to the Prophet wasallam. They just used the Uthmanic Musahif, yeah? And they said we could read whatever we can. So it's like, for example, if I write in English without any vowels, yeah? So if I write R, N, so there's no vowels in that, yeah? Now it could be run, it could be ran, it could be rune, yeah? It could be multiple things, yeah, within that. So what they're trying, what the Orientalists, non-Muslim deceivers, etc. are trying to say is that they ignored this first thing. They just said whatever fits within the Uthmanic Mus'haf is a recited, is an accepted Qur'at, yeah? Reality was there was ijma that prohibited anybody reciting in an accordance to the mushaf without a multiple chain that goes back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They they disagreed with that. Yeah, they said that was kufr and that's not allowed for for people. So that, you know, there were some groups, some uh, uh, sects that would try and do that to try and prove their position. For example, them there was some there was one. Uh, um, Mu'tazilite who tried to recite certain verses to imply that Allah didn't speak to Musa alayhi salam. Um, 
but he, you know, this is considered kufr, an act of disbelief, because it is through the multiple chains of recitation, in accordance to the Uthmanic Musahib, yeah, that it would be considered uh, accepted to Qur'an. The third criteria that was used was that it followed the rules of the Arabic language, yeah, and really that was just a supportive, uh, any, uh, uh, supportive uh, criteria. You know, if you have it multiple chains and you have Uthmanic Musab, then obviously it's going to support the Arabic language. But they also use that as a way to, as an addition, yeah, <clears throat> you know, in, in order to really substantiate that what they have as a recitation is definitely the recitation of the Quran in wording and in meaning. Yeah, I'm just going to have a quick look, see if there's any questions, if any brothers have got any comments. The Quran. Right. The Quran published all over the world, I assume, is in one variant. So, the Quran that's published all over the world are the multiple Qur'at. There are ten considered mutawatir. Yeah? Ibn Mujahid, who was a famous scholar, he popularized the seven. Yeah? But there was considered ten that were considered uh, the can canonized readings of the Quran. And you, you have Qur'ans that are produced in all ten Qur'at yeah? the Qur'at, remember, are the selections so what does that mean again? selections basically means that when we look at Maliki Yawmiddin or Maliki Yawmiddin out of those ten Qur'at six of them have one I think uh, Malik King and the four have Malik the other uh, so it's not like they all are different. They're not all different. They all have different permutations. That's why the Qur'at, the variants, they all support, they're all um, reinforced by the different Qur'at. The variations within the recitations are all supported by the different Qur'at. So six of the Qur'at out of the ten will support Malik. I think it's Malik. Maybe it's Malik, Wallahu Alam, yeah? The other four will support the other, yeah? Qur'an, uh, the other variants, like uh, Malik, yeah? So it's not like they are different, all of them have differences, they're all different. No, they all have different permutations of the accepted variations, yeah? So you don't need to have many, many variations in order to have many, many Qur'at. Because obviously as you increase the number of variations, when you've got maybe three variations in Surah Al-Fatiha, only one by the way has impact upon meaning, which is the Malik and Malik. The other ones don't have any impact upon meaning. But when you have three variations, then you can have, I think was it, is it six or nine permutations to that? I don't know. No, um, maybe some brother good at maths and permutations can tell me how many permutations three does. But it's just three though, at the end of the day, it's just three variations in regards to that and that's why as I mentioned before the variations that affect wording or meaning are actually only less than 1% so the 0.9% of the Quran is less than that right so the other point and this is a I'll leave uh, quickly finish on this point as well uh, sorry okay. which is to do with um, this point about did the Muslims, the Qaris, just focus upon the Uthmanic Mus'haf, Musahib. Did they also, did they just ignore this multiple chains? Did they just look up, uh, that's how the, the Musahif, that's how the Qur'at were developed. The Qur'at, Qur'at were developed just simply because they looked at the outline of the consonants within the Uthmanic Mus'hafs and worked out what the vowels yeah, vowelization was. Was that the case? Now we have other evidences indicate that no, that's completely. First evidence, obviously, as I said, is there's only 0.9%. That's an evidence in itself. Out of over 77,000 words, about 750 words, yeah, have these types of changes. Yeah, changes in the word, in the structure, in the Arab, yeah, in the uh, slight meaning or synonym. Yeah, 
or nouns, dual and plural, yeah? Or singular. Very, so it's very, very few. We're not talking about thousands, yeah? We're talking about very few actual uh, uh, words that have, this, uh, uh, that have these uh, changes. The second uh, evidence, so that's first evidence, very few, because if you think about it, if it was just about how to read the Qur'an according to the Uthmanic Musahif, yeah, where you don't have any vowels and some of the words, some of the letters could be multiple letters like the fa and the ka, the qaf could be two, could, will be represented by the same letter, same symbol, yeah, then you could potentially read it in hundreds of thousands, each verse you could read in multiple ways. But what we find, like for example in Surah Al Fatiha, there's only one, uh, there's only one word out of Surah Al Fatiha that has any impact or meaning. The other example, the other point that indicates that it wasn't just read by Uthmani is the fact that we also have Mim Lam Kaf in another surah, yeah, and that surah would be Surah Al Nas, yeah, Malik Al Nas, yeah, the King of Mankind. So, <clears throat> just like we can say. Uh, Maliki Omiddin, King of the Day of Judgment. We we also say Malikin Nas, but we could also say Malikin Nas, yeah, Master of Mankind. But there is no Qur'at that says Malikin Nas. No accepted Qur'at that accepts that. Even though it's in accordance with the Uthmanic Mus'haf, yeah. So what's controlling it? If it's not the Uthmanic Mus'haf only, what else is it restricting the choices? Multiple chains. Yeah? Multiple chains is restricting it. And like I said, when we look at multiple chains, we're not just looking at the 10 accepted Qur'at. We have many Qur'at. 50, 60 Qur'at, yeah, that have been reported. Maybe even more, 200. But, but of the 10, all the variations are considered multiple chains in accordance with Uthmani Musahid. In agreement with Arabic language, yeah. So we accept it as canonized readings of the Quran. Is what we say. But the other chains, the other qiraat, which are not multiple chains, or may not necessarily agree with Uthmanic Mus'haf, yeah. Then we take them as supportive of the Quran that we have. Yeah. So it supports. So so it supports the qiraat. So for example, there may be. In out of the ten, there may be just one uh, qira'at, qira'a, in which there is only one variation which is not shared by any of the other ten, or the other nine. So it's only one out of the ten that has this variation. But that variation is supported by another 30 or 10 or 15 other qira'at, yeah, which has that variation in. Now, why are those other qira'at not considered part of the canonized one? Because they may have, with, for example, we said the selections, qira'at are sort of fatiha to sort of nas, the choices, the permutations that you take. They may have one choice, yeah, out of the whole of the Qur'an, which did not have multiple chains, or may not agree with the Uthmanic Musa. One choice, or it might be one letter, or one word, or one diacritical mark which had no multiple chains, then that qira'at would no longer be considered a canonized one. Yeah? The ones that were collected and recited by Hafs and Nafi and Ibn Kathir and Makki and Qalun and others, all the variations have multiple chains, Uthmanic, Musaf, etc. But those that don't, in every variation, most of the variations that you find within this, uh, uh, within these irregular shad readings of the qiraat, yeah, recitals, most of them will be mutawatir anyway, or at least multiple chains, yeah. So most of them will be multiple chains, anyway. So therefore, they will add to you know a variance evidence that it goes back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because obviously they have a chain. Of reciter who learns it from another reciter who learns it from another reciter going back to the Prophet وسلم, like Nafi had, like Hafs from Asim, etc. Going back to Prophet. وسلم. So they have that. So the other Qira'at do that. Now some people might say also, well, how 
does it work now when we do tafsir or when we look at ijtihad yeah how do we make ijtihad when you have different qiraat well a mujtahid he like for example you know in that um, example we talked about about wudu you wipe according to the hafs recitation you wash your feet according to the wash recitation you wipe the feet so you know, if somebody's making ijtihad in hafs, he's coming out with one opinion. If he doesn't make ijtihad in warsh, he's going to come out with another opinion. The mujtahid, he has to be aware of all the variants to make ijtihad. Because all the variants are Qur'an. Yeah? All the variants are Qur'an. Yeah? So he has to ver- he has to look at all the variants. Same thing with the mufassirin. Yeah? Normally. Is that you would find a mufassir or a uh, scholar of tafsir, he would make tafsir like, for example, when he looks at uh, Malik and Malik, you know, the Qur'an may be hafs, so you're just going to say in Malik Yomidin, but the tafsir, he will be looking at the different Qur'an, yeah, of that. So he will say in the tafsir, the verse means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king and he is the owner and master of the day of judgment, yeah, so he's taking that. And even those qira'at which are considered irregular, so they're not of the ten, they're not considered the accepted canonized recitations, they're used as explanations or tools to aid tafsir, basically. Yeah, tools to aid tafsir. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. I think I've gone through quite a bit, talked a lot. It's a bit odd doing it on Facebook because with Facebook it's uh, less interaction I find actually. Zoom's a lot better because I can ask brothers questions, get their feedback. Uh, and see if they're listening but hopefully inshallah you've learnt you know you've you know, obviously it's not about necessarily learning something but you know you, you know understand something a little bit better inshallah if it wasn't uh, hopefully uh, bring something interesting and nuanced to regards to this uh, but also demonstrate how there's internal consistency with the muslim narrative the muslim narrative is what the Quran is the word, is a revelation in wording and meaning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Revealed, it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through angel Jibreel alayhi salam, that was agreed upon as a collective by the companions, that the companions agreed upon the variations that we have to, you know, that exist, that the Quran has come with certain verses, have come with variations. And that we have sunnah that agree, that it confirms in, you know, multiple chains that says that there are seven ahruf. And irrespective of how you define ahruf, ahruf at the end of the day was understood to mean differences in the way it's recited. Variations. And those variations were then categorized into the seven that we talked about. And that the qaris came and they selected... The, the permutations, like the Subway, you go to Subway Sandwich and they ask you what bread, I'll take that bread. You're not taking any bread. Yeah, you can't say Hovis bread or Warburton bread. Yeah, you have to go for, you know, the ones that they give you, Italian herb and cheese bread or whatever. Yeah, you can't go for any bread. Yes, yeah? so make sure it's halal that you go into the Subway. Yeah, so you can't go for any bread. You've got to go for what is accepted. You've got to go for what is accepted variations. What's accepted variation? Is if that variation has a chain going back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Isnad means that it was recited by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It can't just be one chain, it has to be multiple chains. Now some scholars said mutawatir, some scholars said mushur, <coughs> but when they said mushur means well known, means multiple chains, but just not at the level of mutawatir. But when they said mushur, they also added the condition of ijma, yeah, the consensus. Upon the people of the town And when they mean the people of the town They mean Medina, Basra, Kufa I think also Damascus That they agree upon this recitation Yeah, there's nobody that says No, this is not a recitation Now how can a people, you know, the Qur'a How could they agree upon Thousands of them upon a recitation It's because they learnt it Through a multiple transmission So even if we don't have We can't count multiple Mutawad transmission In order to say so they had to have multiple chains to show that the way you recite this verse goes back to the Prophet or the way you recite a particular word or i'rab of the word. Secondly, 
it had to be in accordance with the Uthmanic Musahif. There was more than one official copy with some slight differences. So it accommodated the majority of the Ahruf yeah, of the Quran. And the third, third criteria was that it, was, it had to be in accordance with the Arabic language. So we have that. You know what I mean? Now there may be details and there may be little minutiae debates and discussions But you know at the end of the day look at the level of concern and methodological approach the Muslims had And the early Sahaba and the companion and the Tabi'een and the Taba Tabi'een had Regards to how to understand and lay down the appreciation of the Qur'at Yeah And not just Qur'at, we can talk about other things as well, we can talk about you know, we're not really gone into much detail about how they really, you know, went into the details of preserving the script, the Uthmanic script, uh, the Uthmanic Musa, Musahif. Uh, we're not really gone into the details about talking about Arabic language and how they preserved that. You know, we, we've not really talked about how they looked at Balagha, how they preserved poetry, Jahiliya poetry. Yeah, you know, can you imagine you're preserving poetry, yeah, <coughs> that has no connection to Islam. In order to preserve the wording and meaning of the Quran itself, yeah. So they're not any. Yani, this is not like scribal error. The Fir'at. they are deliberate acceptance. And even the different qadis who had the different Qur'at, they didn't reject the other qadis, yeah. In fact, many of the ten, stroke seven, Qur'an, they learned from each other. They were teachers and students of each other as well, yeah. So, you know, we've got massive, this detailed explanation. You can't find this in anywhere else. We can then also discount other qira'at, which are we call shab, irregular, because it doesn't have multiple chains, it's not in accordance with Uthmanic mus- Musahir. Yeah, so therefore we can say, okay, these are shab readings. They may not even have a chain. Yeah, they may only have only ahad chain. They may, uh, like I said, it's in different... Uh, spellings or different um, you know, synonyms which are not contained within any of the Uthmanic mus- mus- uh, Musahif so we have a methodological approach because of how our Quran is preserved yeah but even if I don't even understand any of this at the end of the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that this Quran is uh, preserved and we can establish that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'm going to end it there because I believe it is Maghrib time. Yes, it is. Subhanallah. Sorry about that, brothers. Uh, inshallah. I uh, hope you found it beneficial. Any questions, any points, any corrections, put them in the comments. Uh, and I'll try and get back to you as soon as. I'll send some links out as well within this. So you can have a look at some of the discussions regards to this as well. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Hopefully, inshallah, it's good. Inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.